Pants my my ass. I'm on my floor. Bonjour, Monsieur Pussycat. Cracking toast, poet. To start uh, spreading the uh, news. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a short podcast about short films. I am your host, and today we are discussing the Academy Award for Best Animated Short. Today's episode is our fifth bonus episode, where I look back at the past decade we discussed and look at any prevailing trends while also looking at the future of the category. And at the end, I'll share my top 10 nominees of the decade and some non nominated recommendations. But before we get into the recap, I'd just like to thank our guests from this past decade. So thank you to Sam Meltzer, Christoph, Gordon McNulty, Beatrice Shazad, Rory Donovan, Michael Slavin, Byrne, Casey Young, Ronaldo Sosa, and Zeta Short. It was, as always, an absolute pleasure talking to all of you. And I can't wait to have each of you back on in the future as well. So let's dive into the 1970s. Long gone are the days of the studio shorts, and it's frankly a miracle that the Academy didn't get rid of this category during this time, because nearly everything nominated this decade is from outside of Hollywood. Whether it be independent independent animation studios, college students experimenting with their own styles and techniques, or shorts funded by foreign governments, this category has left that Hollywood sphere, and we are certainly grateful. Like, I love those early studio shorts as much as the next guy, but I'd rather have the immense variety we get at this period than sitting through 10 Tom and Jerry ripoffs again. But what were the big winners this decade? Well, the National Film Board of Canada is perhaps the biggest, as it finally won three Oscars after 16 nominations thus far, including a losing streak of 12 nominations. Uh, the NFB will go on to win only three more Oscars in the following decades, at least of, as of this recording, which only, honestly makes it a bit funny that they won the same amount of Oscars in the next 40 years as they did in the last three. Though, let's talk about the NFB, because the scope of this podcast doesn't quite cover what they are. For example, while they get 38 nominations and 6 wins in the Best Animated Short category, the NFB overall has 74 Oscar nominations and 12 wins, thanks to their work in documentary filmmaking as well as a few live-action shorts and even one nominee for Best International Film. National Film Board was created in 1938 with the passing of the National Film... Excuse me. National Film Act, and in the law it states that the purpose of the board is to be a. to produce and distribute and to promote the production and distribution of films designed to interpret Canada to Canadians and to other nations, b. to represent the government of Canada in its relations with persons engaged in commercial motion picture film activity in connection with motion picture films for the government or any department thereof, c to engage in research in film activity and to make available the results thereof to persons engaged in the production of films, d. to advise the governor and council in connection with film activities, and e. to discharge such other duties relating to film activity as the governor and council may direct the board to undertake. To simplify that, it was essentially a way to make films to promote Canadian excellence to the world as well as to research film techniques. The board established 12 units for its film production, most of which were dedicated to documentaries, newsreels, and wartime propaganda, though there was also the animation branch, led by Norman McLaren, and the NFB did on occasion make fiction films too, but in general, what you would expect a government to make. Hey, films to promote the government and its ideals, or to educate about the nation's history, things to make people give the government more money. And that's about the gist of what there is to say. I could go through the long, long history of all the bureaucratic changes to the NFB and how it functions, how the 12 units became four and then went to seven. That's not that, that interesting. But what I do want to shine a light on is some notable incidents in NFB's history. The main thing is that the NFB is constantly getting in trouble for being too left-wing in terms of its politics. A lot of the more nationalistic Canadians get really heated when they find that the NFB is making some films that look fondly on things like the Russian Revolution and the Chinese Communist Party, or things that make Canada seem less powerful than it is, or cast some doubt on some of the military achievements Canada touts for itself. 
1983 film The Kid Who Couldn't Miss discuss, discussed World War I fighter pilot uh, Billy Bishop and called into question many of Bishop's accomplishments, which many Canadians did not care for and got very, very mad about claiming it got very mad about it, claiming it was tarnishing Canada's image. My favorite story, however, regards an Oscar winner that this time for documentary short. If You Love This Planet is a 1982 film featuring a lecture from Dr. Helen Caldicott with some additional archive footage as well discussing the seriousness and the potential destruction of nuclear weapons. It is a film that is not only intensely anti-nuclear weapon, constantly emphasizing the immense loss of life and culture, all the pain caused by them, but also the film takes a few jabs at the U.S. and Soviet governments and even features a wartime propaganda film that starred Ronald Reagan. That is what I think is really ignited the ensuing controversy. Upon its release, If You Love This Planet, along with two films about acid rain, which was an issue in Canada caused by American smokestacks, it was deemed political propaganda by the Department of Justice. Under the Foreign Agents Registration Act of 1938, the distributor of the films in the U.S. was required to register as foreign agents, meaning they were directly or indirectly supervised, directed, controlled, financed, or subsidized in whole or in major part by a foreign principal, and foreign principal meaning the Canadian government. And the distributor would also have to add a disclaimer to the beginning of the films stating that they were political propaganda. Keep in mind, that act I brought up was originally passed in order to combat Nazi propaganda in the lead-up to World War II, and now it's being used because the Canadians said that Ronald Reagan's precious nukes weren't cool. Although, reading into this, there have been several instances in the past in which the U.S. government raised an eyebrow at the stuff the NFB was making, but usually the Canadian government would step in and smooth things over. But Canada's External Affairs Department was not jumping in to help this time. So it went to court with those on the side of the NFB saying that the classif classification of the films as propaganda is a violation of the First Amendment rights, while the Department of Justice states that there is no infringement of rights or censorship being afflicted with the classification. The case even made its way to the Supreme Court and, in a 5-3 ruling, sided with the Department of Justice, as the classification of a film as propaganda does not inhibit its distribution in any way, and the term political propaganda is a neutral, even-handed, and without pejorative connotation, and is therefore constitutionally permissible and can encompass materials that are completely accurate and merit the highest respect. Though the case was lost, don't feel too bad for the NFB here. Like they say, any publicity is good publicity, and when accepting the Oscar for If You Love This Planet, director Terry Nash said, Well, you really know how to show a foreign agent a good time. For the tre tremendous effort in promoting If You Love This Planet, I'd like to thank the U.S. Department of Justice. A while ago, we were talking about the 1970 nominees for Best Animated Short. Although, I feel there isn't too much more to really analyze here. The 70s and 80s are pretty stagnant decades for this category. Not many changes in terms of the animation, that being the fact that pretty much all forms of animation are being celebrated in this category, from traditional to stop motion to even more marginal animation types like collage, sand animation, and the first commu computer animated nominee. And it's only once we start here getting Pixar and Aardman nominations that we really start to see a change in the category. So perhaps we shall just jump on ahead to the fun part of the bonus episodes, which is me giving my top 10 favorite nominees of the 1970s. So number 10 is Monsieur Pointu, a gem of pixelation animation, just a simple and delightful film about a man struggling to play a violin, perhaps a tad long, but fun just the same. Number nine is Special Delivery, a comedy of errors about a man who accidentally kills his mailman with things snowballing further and further into the absurd. Great dark comedy, love it. Uh, number eight is The Bead Game, a mesmerizing film that shows the history of evolution and humanity and war through this gorgeous bead animation. It's simple but effective. Number seven, Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2. As I said last decade, it's Winnie the Pooh. Come on. What more do you need? Winnie the Pooh. We love it. It's great. Number six is Hunger. This early example of com computer animation uses the eerie, strange, and caniness of this 
of the tech to its benefit, creating this grotesque story about a man who consumes and eats everything, haunting yet still a tad hilarious at the strangest of it all. Number five is The Sandcastle. Fantastic sand and foam, an foam animation brings various unique sand creatures to life as they build a sandcastle. For what it lacks in story, it makes up for in sheer charm and wonder. It's just a wonderful world to live in for a few minutes. Number four is Dedalo or Labyrinth. Uh, the rare times we get to see horror in this category are so beautiful because you know they wouldn't nominate it unless it was damn good. The work of Manfredo Manfredi wows me again and again with his atmospheres and character designs and hard-to-parse stories, and this is perhaps his masterpiece. I highly recommend watching this. Number three is Dream Doll. You start with a conceit like a man gets followed by an inflatable sex doll, and you quickly imagine some comedic possibilities. Uh, the film starts with that, but is also able to bring you on this grand emotional journey, and by the end, as you watch hundreds of sex dolls fly through the sky, you want to cry. It's beautiful. Number two is a Doonesbury special. The final film by animation master John Hubley adds a charming, relaxed, mel melancholic, and reflective adaptation of the Doonesbury comics. Oh, and it's really funny too. A everything you want in a TV special based on a newspaper comic. Peanuts fucking wishes. And number one is The Legend of John Henry. A retelling of one of the greatest American myths, the film combines striking animation and powerful music to bring forth every emotion that this story has, and it could move mountains with how powerful this short is. And that's my top 10. I I'm sorry to all the Crunchbird fans out there who wished it'd be on here, uh, but anyways, here's a handful of recommendations that weren't nominated for Oscars. I want to start with my favorite non-nominated animated short from this decade, House of Flame by, by Kiyichiro Kawamoto. I don't want to say anything about the plot, but it's a Japanese stop-motion film that is utterly gorgeous to look at, and I highly recommend checking it out ASAP. From there, there's a few scattered foreign animated films I can shout out. The Soviets gave us Hedgehog in the Fog by Yuri Norstein. From Yugoslavia, we have Sati Mania a film animating to the music of Eric Satie, and I have two films by Italian Manfredo Manfredi, uh, Sotorania, meaning underground, and Clouds. Uh, both excellent, excellent films. On the topic of filmmakers nominated in the past decade, I'd like to shout out how the Faith in John Hubley film Cockabooty, as well as Caroline Leaf's The Owl Who Married a Goose, and Peter Fold's Metadata which uses the same computer technology as Hunger, except Metadata was the first film to use that technology. Lastly, a few films from the NFB. Uh, I have another Caroline Leaf film co-directed by Veronica Soule, titled Interview, which has the two animators interviewing each other as they animate themselves. Uh, then there's The City Osaka, which was made by Kai Pindle for the Osaka Exposition, which imagines a bustling Canadian city where everything stops everything stops when the hockey's on um, and lastly there's the energy carol which is one of the greatest adaptations of christmas carol i've ever seen and it also happens to be a psa about energy consumption and that's it that's all i have for you for this bonus episode join us again next week as we dive into the 1980s i hope ronald reagan is rotting in hell thank you listener for tuning in this has been the short podcast about short films until next time goodbye <laughs>